Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Certain federal party leaders have decided to skip the Calgary Stampede. Political columnist Brian Lilly will have details and explain why. The CBC has handed out more bonuses for its executives and the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is speaking out against it. And there was a surprise at the Lethbridge Courthouse as the trial of the Coots 2 continues. BCN's Landon Hickok has an update. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Even after months of being grilled on the subject in committee, the head of the CPC, Catherine Tate, and a number of executives with a public broadcaster ended up receiving more taxpayer-funded bonuses. That doesn't sit well with a large number of Canadians, including Franco Terrazano, the federal director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, who joins us from Ottawa. Franco, the CPC approved more bonuses for 1,200 staff. At this point, do we know how much more? We don't know how much the final cost of these taxpayer-funded bonuses will be, but we do know that the CBC just approved a fresh batch of bonuses for about 1,200 non-union management and CBC executives. But we also know that the CBC is going to waste more taxpayers' money hiring a consulting firm to review the CBC's compensation and bonuses. But look, we don't need the CBC to be wasting that money reviewing their bonuses. They don't have to review their bonuses. They need to end the taxpayer-funded bonuses at the CBC. Now, Franco, the CBC rubber stamped $14.9 million in bonuses last year, even though 234 jobs were cut in the 2023-2024 fiscal year. Even those who work in the public broadcaster have been speaking out against this. Well, we've heard a lot of outcry from Canadians across the country. The fact that the CBC handed out almost $15 million in taxpayer-funded bonuses in 2023 as the CBC announced hundreds of layoffs just weeks before Christmas and also as the CBC's president was crying poor, begging the government for more taxpayer cash. Uh, but, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the CBC's taxpayer-funded bonuses because since 2015, the CBC's bonuses have cost taxpayers $114 million. Even though it appears less Canadians are watching the CBC right now, the federal government gave them a top-up of $42 million, raising the amount we're paying the CBC to, what, over a billion dollars? The CBC will cost taxpayers about $1.4 billion this year. And remember, folks, every single year, the CBC costs taxpayers more than $1 billion. And what's so crazy about all of this, you know, despite the fact that the CBC is taking more than a billion dollars from taxpayers every single year, their president and CEO, Catherine Tate, is still crying poor and is claiming that the CBC is chronically underfunded. But, like, come on, folks. In, in no world is the CBC chronically underfunded when they're taking more than a billion dollars from taxpayers every single year. And you know what? The Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we have been very loud in calling for the government to defund the CBC. Thanks so much for your time today, Franco. That was Franco Terrazano, Federal Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, joining us from Ottawa. It appears as though the Trudeau government is still toying with the idea of implementing a capital gains tax on your primary residence. That means when you sell the home you're living in, you'll have to pay Ottawa tax. Needless to say, that's not a very popular idea with many Canadians. Sun political columnist Brian Lilly explains how it would potentially work. It would have been a 50% capital gains tax on your home if you sold within the first year. 25% in the second year, then 15, 10, down to 5 if you sold the home after five years. But that's still a, a big hit. So uh, the Liberals know that this is politically unpopular, but they keep going back to it. They keep funding studies by this uh, professor, academic head of the University of British Columbia named Paul Kershaw. He's behind a group called Generation Squeeze. What do they advocate for? Lots of housing changes, including taxing the income that you make from the growth and value of your home. Mr. Lilly will also discuss which federal party leaders are attending this year's stampede and which ones are not in Calgary. We'll have details coming up later in our broadcast. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is at the 2024 NATO summit taking place in Washington, D.C. The event is being hosted by the NATO Climate Change and Security Center of Excellence. 
Trudeau says his government continues to lead the way when it comes to combating climate change. Back home, our government has shown global leadership in addressing the climate crisis. We've placed a price on pollution that simultaneously reduces our emissions and puts more money in the pockets of 8 out of 10 Canadians. We launched Canada's first national adaptation strategy to build stronger and more resilient communities. We became the first major oil producing nation to introduce a cap on emissions from the oil and gas sector. And we're creating hundreds of thousands of good paying sustainable jobs from coast to coast to coast with our $160 billion investment in our net zero economic plan and green industrial strategy. Green Party Deputy Leader Jonathan Pedno announced that he is stepping down from his position for personal reasons. That leaves Elizabeth May as the Green Party's sole leader here in Canada. Uh, when I decided to come back to this country after 14 years in conflict areas, uh, working to advance the cause of peace and human rights, it was very clear to me that this country was uh, on a pathway that is uh, fairly dangerous. Uh, there's a lot of things we take for granted in this country. Uh, my departure today is for personal reasons. I won't be uh, providing uh, further comments on that, but I do want to say that uh, Greens throughout the country continue to exemplify what politics should be about, collaboration, uh, hard work, uh, and mo most importantly, a commitment to this country and its citizens, uh, something that I think other parties could very well learn from. Pedno won the leadership in November of 2022 on a partnership ticket with May, who had previously served as leader from 2006 to 2019. With a recent increase in bear attacks here in our province, the Alberta government announced more steps to help protect Albertans. Government officials say they're now creating a new network of wildlife management responders to help stop dangerous grizzly bear attacks on people and livestock. When a problem animal is identified, members will help provide rapid conflict response times across the entire province. That could include tracking and euthanizing a problem animal. Officials emphasize that this is not a bear hunt, but a measured approach to ensure the safety of people and livestock. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about the National Child Care Plan. Some are for it and others are against it. Susan Cake, chair with Child Care Now Alberta, says her group does not support the idea of Alberta excluding itself from the federal child care plan. And she says there are many questions surrounding what an Alberta-made plan would actually look like. Cake also says that Ottawa is funding more than 75% of all child care spending in Alberta in 2025 and 2026. She says it makes sense that they would want to ensure the federal funds are spent in alignment with their national plan since they're funding most of it. The $10 a day program in general is positive. It's one of the biggest government investments in child care. It's made child care more affordable to the families who can access it. I think the issue that people have is where do the problems stem from? So on the one hand, we see some of the other provinces rolling it out and they're not facing the same issues that Alberta is. We also see Alberta doing a lot of consultations and this would mean that they tend to have a lot of power when it comes to designing the program. So when, we, when I look at it, I see that Alberta can design it differently to actually address a lot of the shortcomings. But again, they haven't actually come up with a plan or to say exactly what part of the federal deal is preventing them from doing what they would like to do. And so I question if, you know, this divisiveness of opting out of federal programs, is this ideological or is this actually about getting the best deal or the best programs for Alberta? Because frankly, I don't think parents care Who's, who is actually designing the system, as long as it works. According to the Alberta government, $3.8 billion will be invested in childcare for kids up to the kindergarten age. We seem to be getting more clarity now from the trial of Chris Carpenter and Anthony Olenek, otherwise known as the Coots 2. BCN's Landon Hickok is the Lethbridge Courthouse once again. And Landon, it's becoming apparent what the intentions of the accused actually were. Thanks, Hal. You know, with how hot and balmy it is this week, it wasn't really that bad uh, sitting in a nice air-conditioned courthouse as we continued uh, going through evidence throughout the trial of Anthony Olenek and Chris Carbert here at the Lethbridge Courthouse. 
Now, the court has reviewed through some more images of firearms and body armor from the seized phones, including one of those of Anthony Olenix. Uh, his defense lawyer, Marilyn Burns, made the argument that those images of firearms and body armor that were not admissible to the court, since they were all stored in his cell phone's cash, that doesn't necessarily mean that he interacted with them or even visually saw them. It could have been through a large friend's group chat or through Instagram, anywhere on the internet or social media where he would not have been able to see them. We've then seen the court review a conversation between Jeremy and Mark Morin on the day February 14th when RCMP officers began moving into the court's border blockade to break it up and make arrests. This conversation was made after Anthony Olenek was arrested, before Jerry Moore and Chris Carbert was arrested. In these conversations of Jerry and Mark, they were arguing of the state of the protest and of the RCMP's next actions. Mark made the point that the RCMP will probably be waiting until the protesters were to theoretically fire the first shot and would just be waiting around for nothing. So they would just go back home. Since we understand that Anthony Olenek and the other accused have made comments about preparing for a war against the RCMP, because the Morns did not know about the arrests of the two men while they were still planning for their next steps and did not hold any violent intentions, uh, even if they did go back to the Coots border blockade, the defense lawyers say that this negates the charge of conspiring to murder police officers on Olenek and Carbert, since the two men stayed in touch with the Morns in planning during their time there. Now, late last week, the judge apparently had to dismiss a juro because in multiple instances, she was dozing off when evidence was being presented to the court. So now the number of the jury is now down to 13 with the verdict expected on July 19th, a week and a half from today. And as we can maybe see here, some light in the tunnel in this trial as we near Possibly the end in a week and a half's time as we expect the verdict on July 19th. We'll give you the updates as they come here on Bridge City News. Al? Thanks so much, Landon. Alec Baldwin arrived at court with his wife and baby as jury selection has begun in the actor's involuntary manslaughter trial. Baldwin, who is 66 years old, could receive up to 18 months in prison if jurors unanimously decide to convict him. The jurors have to decide whether Baldwin committed a felony when during rehearsal in October of 2021, a gun went off while he was pointing it at cinematographer Helena Hutchins, killing her and wounding the director, Joel Souza. They were on the set of the Western film Rust in New Mexico, which is where the trial is being held. Power is slowly returning for some of the millions of homes and businesses that were left in the dark after hurricane barrels slammed in the Houston, Texas area. Many homeowners say, they're having to rebuild their lives. Normally, we're the ones helping people, and so this is the first time that it's actually hit close to home. Uh, it's overwhelming. And there's people here that probably have to rebuild their house from the bottom up, you know, to us, you know, just having a broken window and a little bit of the roof fly off, you know. They, they, their house is gone. And right now, when day one, hopefully we'll get it back soon. Because that's a lot of people, and you have some uh, that's maybe my age, you know, and I'm 85. Today is my birthday. Samaritan's Purse, meanwhile, has airlifted dozens of personnel and tons of relief supplies, which includes medical to Grenada and Karakou Island, where Hurricane Barrel made landfall last week as a Category 5 storm. Everyone in Karakou lost everything. They lost their home, they lost their clothes, they lost their food, they lost water. It's in a mess. It's not a place where anybody would want to be right now. Samaritan's Purse is responding to Grenada and Karakou Island. Karakou Island specifically has been very impacted by this storm. The entire island is devegetated. Up to 90% of homes are destroyed. So people don't have a good place to shelter, good water right now. People are lacking medical care on the island. So we're coming to respond to that. As you can see behind me, we just brought our DC-8 aircraft in with about 64,000 pounds of cargo, which is a Tier 1 emergency field hospital. 
this is the mobile desalinization unit that we brought in uh, from North Carolina. It can take ocean water and make fresh drinking water for up to 3,500 people a day. The people have endured a lot in the last couple of days, but we're excited to come here to bring them hope. Not just items, not just water, not just medical care, but we want to bring them hope. We want to bring them hope that only Jesus can bring them. Thank God for the efforts of Samaritan's Purse. Wow. The Israel Defense Forces say they dealt another massive blow to Hamas in Gaza City by taking out a number of terrorists who were holding up in an UNRWA school. TBN Israeli correspondent Yer Pinto has more now in this report. The IDF also clarified that prior to the attack, a number of steps were taken to reduce the risk of harm to civilians, including evacuating civilians from the area. The statement concluded that the IDF will continue to act with determination in order to hit the enemy precisely. In a related story, the IDF issued a statement on Monday morning that the alert that was activated in the Nahal Oz area adjacent to the northern Gaza Strip was due to a rocket that was launched from the Sajaya area. The rocket fell in an open area, causing no casualties. A short time later, the fire center of Division 98 directed an airstrike to eliminate the terrorists who carried out the launch and destroyed the building from which the launch was carried out. Elsewhere, the IDF reported that in the last 24 hours, it had attacked terrorists who are staying at the area of an UNRWA school, al Juani school, in the center of the Gaza Strip. Rescue operations stretched into a second straight day in Kyiv following deadly Russian strikes in the Ukrainian capital on Monday. The death toll has climbed to 43 following the attacks in a number of Ukrainian cities, 33 in Kyiv alone. At least two people were killed and 16 others were wounded following a strike on a hospital in the region. The facility in Kyiv, Ukraine is the largest children's medical center. Each year around 7,000 surgeries, including treatments for cancer, are conducted at the facility. Officials say two floors of the hospital were completely demolished. Meanwhile, here at home, Lethbridge City officials say an increasing number of encampments are being discovered and dismantled in Lethbridge's River Valley. In a report presented to City Council on July the 9th, General Manager of Community Social Development, Andrew Malcolm, says the city's encampment strategy has resulted in some changes in the nature and location of the encampments. He says some of the encampments are being constructed of more permanent materials such as wood and other building materials and are being found in harder to reach locations. We are seeing behaviors change. Um, structures are becoming um, more dynamic in terms of the materials. The locations are becoming um, more entrenched in the river valley into more difficult locations. And the behaviors of the individuals are a little bit more dynamic for our team to deal with. According to the report, a total of 221 encampments were dealt with between January 1st and June the 13th. Well, Environment Canada has issued a heat warning for our region here. It's been sizzling hot. Apparently, the 30-plus degree temperatures will be sticking with us for the rest of the week. Um, you know, the peak of this uh, heat event right now is essentially today and tomorrow. Um, that being said, though, we are still looking at, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to call it a cool down, but really um, come Thursday, Friday, back down from 36 tomorrow, back down towards that 30 or 31. Um, but really for Southern Alberta, there isn't too much of an end to this heat really expected. Um, the hottest day will be tomorrow, but we're still looking at temperatures right around the 30 mark um, or even into the low 30s right through the end of next week and potentially even through the end of July. As for how the rest of the country is shaping up weather-wise, we'll have those details coming up right after the break. A heat warning was issued by Environment Canada earlier today as we saw a scorcher above 30 degrees across much of southwestern Alberta. Tonight, it should be mainly clear with a low near 19 degrees. Wednesday, expect lots of sunshine again and a high near 36. We could even break a record. Thursday, still pretty hot under a clear sky with a high near 34. Cooling off slightly on Friday to 31 degrees. A sunny, hot weekend is shaping up for us so far. Expect a high of 34 degrees on Saturday, sunshine and 30 degrees for Sunday. Monday, lots of sunshine once again with a high expected near 32. Now the average high for this time of year is 25 degrees with an average low of 10. The record high was 36 degrees set back in 1968 and the record low 
was a chilly 3 degrees back in 1999. The sun rose at 535 and will set at 938. Let's see how the rest of the country is shaping up for Wednesday. Expect a clear day on the west coast, sunshine at 24 degrees for Vancouver, mainly sunny and 26 for Victoria. Make sure you bring a hat, a water bottle, lots of sunscreen if you're headed to the Calgary Stampede. It'll be a balmy high of 33 tomorrow. Edmonton will be even hotter with a high expected near 36. Sunshine and 30 degrees is on tap for Regina, Saskatchewan. Sunny and 32 for Saskatoon. Now the rain clouds cleared out of Winnipeg. Expect a blue sky and a high of 30 degrees on Wednesday. Good day to head out to Grand Beach. Clouds and showers in Toronto tomorrow with a high expected near 23. Ottawa will be one degree cooler with showers and in Montreal expect an overcast day with rain and a high near 27 degrees. Lots of humidity is expected in Atlantic Canada. Expect rain and a high of 31 degrees in Fredericton. Showers and 29 is on tap for Halifax. Clouds and rain in Charlottetown with a high near 26. And in St. John's expect rain with a high of 25 degrees on Wednesday. Many plant-based refrigerated beverages from brands Silk and Great Value are being recalled due to listeria concerns. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency triggered the nationwide recall on Monday following an investigation into foodborne illness outbreak associated with the recalled products. Silk brand almond milk, coconut milk, almond and cashew milk and oat milk along with Great Value brand almond milk have all been recalled. Most of the products have a best before date of October the 4th. More than 44,000 power adapters sold with some Hatch Baby sound machines have been recalled in Canada because of an electrical hazard. Health Canada says the recall applies to an AC adapter that's included with some Hatch Baby Rest First generation sound machines. It says the plastic housing from the adapter can become loose when removing it from a power outlet. That would lead to exposed power prongs which poses an electrical hazard. Those with the affected sound machines are being asked to stop using the power adapter, cut its cord, and get a free replacement from the company. An Alberta energy company has agreed to pay $3 million in fines for misleading the province's utilities watchdog about its costs in two separate projects. Atco Electric has also agreed to refund $4 million and recompense for unearned rate increases. That deal will now go before the Alberta Utilities Commission. ATCO reported costs three years before incurring them, so Alberta customers were paying a rate increase in 2015 to compensate the company for a tab the company had not yet covered, giving it three years of profit. Now, the second instance, the company inflated the cost of accommodation at a construction site. The statement says ATCO overstated the number of rooms it was paying for through its purchase of a work camp in Beaver River. While ATCO claimed it paid for over 56,000 nights, the real number was closer to just under 26,000. KFC has gone viral after customers learned that the chicken chain has been serving halal meat in the past couple of months. The American fast food chain collaborated with its KFC Canada Muslim team to include halal menu options back in May in Ontario restaurants excluding Ottawa and Thunder Bay. Restaurants in the rest of the country will follow suit by the end of the year. Company officials have also discontinued pork products at all locations except for those co-branded with Taco Bell. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 83 points on the day to finish at 22,042. The Dow was down 52 points to 39,291. The S&P 500 was up four on the day to 55.76, and the NASDAQ was up 25 points to 18,429. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 59 cents to 81.74 U.S. per barrel. Natural gas was down two cents to 235 U.S. Gold was up 526 on the day to 23.64.39 U.S. an ounce, and silver was down a cent to $30.75 U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at $7.89 per bushel, barley's at $5.92, canola's at $14.44, and corn is at $7.16 per bushel. Live cattle August contract was down $2 to $182.35. Feeder cattle August contract was down $3.45 to $2.55.73, and lean hogs were down $0.35 cents to $89.33. The Canadian dollar was even over the past 24 hours at 73.33 U.S.
Recapping one of our top stories, defense lawyers for Chris Carbert and Anthony Olenek have claimed that enough evidence has been presented to negate the charge of conspiring to commit murder of police officers for both men. Also, the jury is now down to 13 as one member has been dismissed by the judge late last week for falling asleep a number of times while evidence was being presented to the court. The verdict of the Coots 2 is expected by July the 19th. The greatest outdoor show on earth is on in Calgary. Neither Prime Minister Justin Trudeau nor NDP leader Jagmeet Singh are anywhere to be found in Calgary. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev is there, however, to a raucous and very appreciative crowd. Political columnist Brian Lilly will have details for us momentarily. When you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also, be sure to visit our website anytime to check out a number of stories and interviews. You know, many people call it the greatest outdoor show on earth. The Calgary Stampede is a 10-day Western-style extravaganza with an incredible rodeo, fireworks, midway, and concerts. It attracts more than a million local and international visitors each and every year. But it won't be attracting our Prime Minister this year, however, who's decided to skip the event. To chat about this in more detail is Sun political columnist Brian Lilly, who joins us once again from Toronto. Brian, many within the Liberal caucus say it wasn't possible with Justin Trudeau also having to attend NATO meetings right now. Well, I mean, that is correct because no one has developed a technology to transport a, an individual from Calgary to Washington in what, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, in, in five days. You possibly can't. It's a ridiculous argument, Hal. Of course he could have attended and if he was scheduled to attend. They've known when Stampede was for a long time. They knew when the NATO meetings were. Um, he could have shown up Friday or Saturday, still been in Washington, D.C. for plenty of time for the NATO meetings if he had been flying to, you know, the far side of Poland for this meeting. OK, maybe because, you know, it doesn't matter what age you are, what shape you're in. Um, travel like that takes a toll and you want to be at your best. And so maybe you need to. OK, no, no, we're not going to fly out to Calgary and then fly all the way to to Warsaw or beyond for a meeting. That'll be too much. You know, big drain. He's got to be sharp. This is Calgary to uh, Washington, D.C. This guy travels across the country all the time. And in fact, what was he doing on the weekend? He was in Toronto attending multicultural events and going to a, a Hindu temple and things like that, which is, you know, all fine, normal political stuff for people to do. But don't say that it's due to scheduling. We know why he's not there. He would be about as popular as that pancake flip that everyone was sharing over the weekend on social media, where Justin Trudeau flips a pancake, I think it was at last year's stampede, and it just splatters everywhere. He wasn't welcome. That's why he didn't go. That's why Jagmeet Singh, the NDP leader, didn't go. Nothing to do with, with, with logistics or anything else. And by the way, well, Singh wasn't there. Nahid Nenshi was, and he had a huge reception. So, you know... It, they're making excuses with anything else they tell you. It's their popularity. Now, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev is attending the stampede, and he was fairly well received. At one event he attended, the crowd even broke out in a thunderous rendition of O Canada. Yeah, they did. And I'll tell you, you know, I, I've seen political events start, especially down east. Down east, they're a little old fashioned, and you start a political meeting, and everyone stands and uh, they say no Canada, but it tends to be small crowds and it's well planned out. And that, that's how every meeting starts. Uh, that was something when Pierre showed up on stage and the crowd just started singing no Canada and he joined in and everyone on stage. But that is normal patriotic Canada. I keep hearing that we have no patriotism. Uh, people don't uh, lo like the country. They don't like the troops. I go to a hockey game. I go to a baseball game. I go to concerts. I was at a Brooks and Dunn concert a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, they're very much about the red, white, and blue in America. They brought three Canadian soldiers in uniform on stage and sang their praises, and the crowd of more than 20,000 people went wild. Uh, people want to be patriotic about their country. We just happen to be led by someone who doesn't believe in patriotism, believes that Canada is the first post-national state, that we have no core identity. And in Pierre Polyev, maybe the crowd sees something that says, you know what? No, we are who we are and we are Canadian and this is a great country and let's celebrate it. 
So wait a minute, you saw Brooks and Dunn. Did you get the chance to do the boot scoot and boogie? Uh, all three, yes, <laughs> all three. It was a great time. Brian, let's talk a bit about the polls right now. Where do the Tories, Liberals, and NDP stand? There have been some polls that show a, a slight tightening, but we're still talking a slight of like 41 to 27, let's say. But it's still a 15 to 20 point lead um, across the country. Justin Trudeau remains highly unpopular. Pierre Polyev is the uh, the favorite to be best prime minister. He's not winning by a landslide on that, uh, but he's still ahead of Trudeau, Singh, and none of the above, which a little while ago, you couldn't say that. Um, but for the last you know, six months plus, Pierre Polyev has been coming out on top as the uh, as the main um, uh, choice for best prime minister. The one poll that did show that tightening that I mentioned, there was a big blip in Atlantic Canada that I'm not sure will hold, and that could just be noise. And when I talk to pollsters, that's what they say. If there's something that's out of the ordinary, it could just be something off, and they may be oversampled in one area or another. But the overall trend is still towards a massive majority. I was seeing one polling uh, model that said the Conservatives would get, one said 213 seats, another said 218. The Liberals would lose 99 seats. Uh, things are very good for Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives, and they're very bad for Justin Trudeau and the Liberals and for Jagmeet Singh and the NDP. Everyone's talking about, well, you know, will Justin Trudeau quit? Should he? Should they have a national caucus meeting, a leadership what about the NDP? They got 11%, 10.9, 10.9% in that Toronto St. Paul's by-election. When people fled from the Liberals, they didn't go to the NDP, they went to the Conservatives. Now let's circle back to your Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, in Washington once again, Brian. There's a lot of pressure on Canada to increase defence spending, and a new report now says we're even spending less than what the government claims? The government's been claiming that they're going to hit 1.7, I believe 1.76%, this year, that that is their, their target, their goal. Um, the parliamentary budget officer has come out with a review and said they've miscalculated. It's actually going to be below 1.5%. Uh, you know, when you're going into a NATO meeting where you're in the, the, you know, the bottom quarter of the class, never mind the bottom half, the bottom quarter, when you've had country after country step up, um, this is something. Hey, look, Every American president, going back decades, has been harping at NATO members to step up with their defense spending. Very few of the countries were meeting the 2% of GDP target, and Canada hasn't met it in decades. The uh, Whether it was Bill Clinton or George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, Trump got some countries to, uh, to step up with bluster and threats. The Russian invasion of Ukraine made a lot of countries, especially those in Eastern Europe, step up. Some of the other European countries have stepped up. We're down at the bottom of the class with Luxembourg. And we're, we're not investing in R&D. We're not investing in new proper equipment. And we still use our defense spending as if it's a, uh, an industrial, um, a regional industrial development program where we make sure the jobs are in key ridings that uh, politicians want to win. You know, we've just announced a new shipbuilding program that is more about keeping jobs in certain areas than buying us the best ship. It's going to cost way more, and it's going to take years and years and years more to build. That's not how we should be operating. Brian, the recent employment report by Stats Canada showed some worrying numbers right now. The study was backed up by an issue that you've been talking about for quite some time, immigration outpacing job growth. Yeah, and Hal, I was talking to a uh, an HR specialist who works in placing people in jobs, uh, works with recruiting agencies, and he says every week he's got new immigrants in his office distraught because they were sold a bill of goods on coming to Canada. These aren't the, the, the folks that come as temporary foreign workers or international students and then get here. These are people coming through the, 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 the regular economic immigrant channels, the permanent residence class. And it, it, right now, he said, they're being sold a bill of goods. Come to Canada. You'll get a good job. You'll get a home. Life's going to be better. And that's not the reality. It's not the reality for Canadians anymore either. And it's not the reality for new immigrants. Uh, on both temporary foreign workers and new immigrants, the unemployment rate is above 10%. Uh, one's at 11, one's at 12%. Um, the overall unemployment rate has crept up to 6.4%. Just over a year ago, it was at five. 
this has been creeping up because you read the StatsCan report. This past month, we lost 1,400 jobs. We added 99,000 people to the work or to the population of working age population of 15 and over. Every single month, we're adding that type of population growth. That is not sustainable. As the prime minister has said, it's more people than we can absorb. So we, we don't, you know, housing crisis in much of the country, a jobs crisis. Um, and what is the government's response? It's to talk about it, but not do anything. Yeah, let's talk a bit more about that housing crisis in many regions of the country right now, Brian. Now, you say the Trudeau government continues to flirt with the idea of a capital gains tax when selling your home? Yeah, this is something they've been back and forth on since 2018. And then when people like myself write about it, they say, oh, no, 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 that's fake news. They've actually claimed that it is fake news that they want to do this. And when I first reported on it, it was... Uh, based off of a Liberal Party policy document, it had Liberal Party logo on it. It had the MP who brought it forward that they wanted a capital gains tax. They said it was to deal with speculators and ho home flippers. And so uh, under that proposal, which they considered but ultimately rejected years ago, it would have been a 50% capital gains tax on your home if you sold within the first year. 25% in the second year, then 15, 10, down to 5 if you sold the home after five years, but that's still a, a big hit. So uh, the liberals know that this is politically unpopular, but they keep going back to it. They keep funding studies by this uh, professor, academic head of the University of British Columbia named Paul Kershaw. He's behind a group called Generation Squeeze. What do they advocate for? Lots of housing changes, including taxing the income that you make from the growth and value of your home. Now, many Canadians, have decided that this is their best retirement investment option. Yeah, sure, they're going to have some RRSPs. Sure, they're going to have maybe a small company pension plan that pays out a bit, but not a ton. They're going to have the CPP, but their big nest egg is going to be their home, which they hope to sell one day. And the part of the bargain in Canada has been, you're not taxed on the sale of your primary residence. You have a cottage, an investment home, that's different. The Liberals keep flirting with this. They keep talking about it, and then just... Uh, two weeks ago, Trudeau's out in British Columbia. He does an oceans announcement and then turns around and goes and does a, a private, secret town hall with members of Generation Squeeze. Uh, they won't release the full transcript of what was said, especially what they won't release, the question and answer portion. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to trust them on this. Neither should you. And Liberal MPs need to speak up clearly and say that they won't support this because the the Trudeau government is out of cash. It's out of, you know, they just want to keep spending. They're going to look for new ways to tax you, and this is one. Yeah, all that home equity needs to stay with the homeowner and with their families, absolutely. Brian, a new book from a former Liberal cabinet minister is raising some eyebrows, and it doesn't paint a rosy picture of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Yeah, this is Mark Garneau, who served as transportation minister for five years. Then he was foreign minister for, I think, about nine months before Trudeau turfed him. Uh, and Garneau paints a picture that, that's similar to what others have, that Trudeau's not interested in speaking to his cabinet. He doesn't want advice from them. They'll decide everything in the prime minister's office and then tell them what to do. Garneau said, you know, Trudeau had no interest in the transportation file, thought that would change when he became foreign affairs minister. Nope. Uh, no advice sought, no advice given. Uh, completely distant. This is similar to what Bill Morneau has said, the former finance minister. Uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould had even harsher terms. Uh, liberal backbench MP, well, actually, I think she was parliamentary secretary at one point, uh, Selena Cesar Chavanez. She talks about how Trudeau viewed women, especially women of color like her, as tokens to be played and used. Uh, you've got Andrew Leslie, the retired general who was a liberal MP for a long time and, and government whip saying that, you know, back to the issue we were talking about a moment ago, Canada doesn't take defense spending seriously. Garneau and Leslie have both said we are not viewed favorably on the international stage because of the policies and lack of action by the Trudeau government. This is a pattern. When this many people who work closely with you are saying these bad things, maybe it's not them. Maybe it's you. Brian, the Saskatchewan government won a huge reprieve in court. Premier Scott Moe said he would not collect the carbon tax on home heating. And when the feds came to collect, a judge said, well, wait a minute, not so fast. 
It's just an injunction for now, but the feds thought they were going to be able to march in and garnish $42 million from the Saskatchewan government over this carbon tax money that they say they're owed. Uh, you'll recall the Trudeau government uh, announced that they would not collect the carbon tax on home heating oil across the country. Now, that's you'll find some people in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, in BC, in Ontario, elsewhere, that heat with home heating oil. But it's a small minority in most of the country. In Atlantic Canada, it's huge. And they did that change because of political reasons. So Scott Moe said, we're not going to collect the carbon tax on home heating uh, products of any kind in Saskatchewan. Now, he's able to do that. In other provinces like Alberta or here where I am in Ontario, uh, you, the government doesn't own the heating company, uh, the uh, energy company. It's private. It's Enbridge. It's Union. It's TransCanada, what have you. There, it's Sask Energy. So he just told them, don't collect that. We're not remitting it. The federal government uh, you know, was very coy about what their reaction was going to be. The Trudeau government tried to just say, well, we'll see. They hadn't said much. Then they go to court to get this money. It's As I say, it's an injunction for now, but there will be a bigger court case. And I think the, the Mo government will have a valid point here. Political columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for your time today and for joining us from Toronto. Thank you, Hal. With the ongoing housing crisis and high inflation levels, combined with an opioid crisis, there are some serious challenges for low-income families, those with addictions, and the homeless. Joining us now is Ken Kissick. He is a co-founder of Streets Alive Mission in Lethbridge. Ken, welcome back to Bridge City News. Great to have you on today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so Ken... Many of our viewers do know what Streets Alive mission is all about, but maybe some don't. So perhaps you can give us a snapshot of what you do here in Lethbridge. Uh, very quickly, we have two streams. One is the mission stream that deals with the vulnerable population. The other stream is uh, helping people in recovery from the addictions. And just in the first three months from January to the end of the March, we had 4,208 people at, or 4,208 visits to our services in wow. the uh, downtown mission from 1,182 individuals. Um, we added 65 new clients. Uh, within the recovery program, we have a waiting list of 104 people uh, waiting for 55 beds that we currently have that are full. We did 15 intakes in that period of time. So it's high volume. It is we're the closet for the street people, and we are a, a faith-based uh, recovery program that's abstinence-based. So that's, that's us in a nutshell. Yeah, you are very, very needed, especially right now with the crisis that's going on. So, uh, Ken, how bad is the opioid crisis in Lethbridge right now? Has it stayed about the same, or has it improved or gotten worse? It's bad, and it's getting worse. Yeah. Uh, 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 the... Lethbridge and, and Blood Reserve lost 153 people in 2023 to opioid. It's, it's awful. That's devastating. Yes, yes. And because all of those people were parts of families. So that's devastation just across the board. Mm -hmm. Okay, now one of the outreaches that you run correct me if I'm wrong, is the Parkside Men's Recovery Home, right? So uh, it's now recognized by the government of Alberta, and I'm told that this recovery center has an impressive success rate of 78%. Uh, yeah, Parkside Home is part of our recovery road, which is the recovery program that we run, run for men and women. And our recovery program, we provide housing. This is one of the housing units, uh, which is Parkside. It holds up to 16 uh, men. Uh, at any given time. Okay, that, that is an impressive success rate that you have there. Uh, that is, uh, that's an overall success rate on an average over a year. So yes, it, we're, we're very proud of it. Okay, so with that said, maybe describe what happens on a day-to-day -day and weekly basis at a home like this. What kind of assistance is offered? So what you're, what you're going to see is you're going to see individuals in both in the men and women's program that are taking programming. 
They're they're doing things like prayer and proverbs. They're doing recreational therapy. They're doing Genesis one-on-one process. So we have a number of people in one-on-ones. They're in group classes. They're in uh, what we call you know, addictions recovery, which is the the theory part, the clinical part of that. Uh, And then there's a biblical worldview part. So right now we run about 50% of the program is is clinical. 50% of the program is biblical worldview. Wow. And the clinical portion of that, is that run by, uh, you know, counselors, psychologists? What what type of professionals? These are all, everybody's in classes. Mm -hmm. Uh, These are trained individuals that are trained in uh, being able to manage group therapy. Uh, we do, uh, where we're looking for professional counseling, we will send them out to some of the agencies in town. But a large part, it's just group counseling, one-on-one. Um, we're really trying to help them deal with the trauma in their life, walk them through it. Um, it's uh, the, the minimum is 120 days uh, that we ask them to commit to. And then after that, uh, we asked them to commit in in ninety day chunks. Wow. Okay. So that's a that's a good chunk there for sure. Uh, now, can the men's recovery home uh, apparently is in need of replacement? And I understand you're looking at a few options right now, including rebuilding on the current location, but a better option became available. Maybe fill us in a little so, bit. Uh, the the current men's home uh, we purchased it uh, in 1998. Uh, It was an old building at that time. Parts of the building were built in 1909. uh, And it just is at a stage where it's run out of life. Any more money that we put into it isn't there. We were wanting to build on a a lot that we also own right there. But we've since uh, acquired an eightplex uh, that will allow us to um, basically uh, renovate uh, a parking lot that's underneath and put an addition on it. And we would give us 32 beds uh, in a combined atmosphere. Um, and it's located uh, in a more suitable location, not in the downtown. Okay. Uh, Ken, so then if I understand correctly, you already have a large down payment on the building, which would house that men's home along with uh, what you're looking at a hundred or was it $560,000 commitment from the city toward renovations. So the, the project with purchase and renovation is $2.4 million. Uh, we have 560,000 from the city. We're waiting to hear on an $850,000 grant from the province. Uh, we've raised approximately $400,000. And so we need about another $600,000, um, uh, by the end of May, we, we'd like to, to bring that in, uh, and that will allow us to close out the purchase and then begin the renovation process. Okay, well, that's that's still that's a lot of money, and I'm sure donations would be helpful at a time like this, right? So how can viewers donate to the cause? The, uh, we are running what we call our Coming Home campaign. If they go to the website, www.streetsalive.ca, they'll see it on the on the top bar, just click on campaign and uh, you can donate right there. Uh, and just mark it for the campaign. Okay. And then can you also see the need for another building to house this uh, stage four men who have worked through their addiction challenges and are re-entering society? So can you tell us a bit about the building that, that became available for this? So there in this whole process, we were in a process of consolidating our programs. We were spending $350,000 a year plus in lease payments, and we are now actively trying to acquire property where those lease payments will just go into operations. Uh, we had a generous donor who provided uh, uh, close to a million dollars for us. Uh, that allowed us to purchase the Galt Manor, uh, which is an aplex uh, located um, within the community, and it, we are already using that as stage four housing for a number of our people. So that that's in place. Um, the purchase of the eightplex and its renovation will solidify the recovery pro- program because we already own our women's uh, program or our women's housing program. The Segway Home is already uh, renovated and paid for. Okay. So that's that's at stage four. So I'm assuming the stage one is those first 120 days that they have to commit to. And then would stage two be the additional 90 days that you were talking about? At what point did they get to stage four? Maybe stage one and two are the first 120 days. Then stage three and four uh, 
take the time after that. Stage three, they usually stay within our programmed housing. And then stage four, a uh, little less accountability, uh, no on-site staff, those kinds of things. More autonomy. Okay. So, and the next step of that is on their own. Right. So, uh, Ken, how difficult is it for these these gentlemen to find and, and keep a job that will be able to, to pay their bills? Uh, the challenge isn't necessarily getting a job uh, to pay their bills and keeping that job. The challenge is finding a job uh, that will help them continue on their recovery journey. Sometimes the jobs they had, uh, the environment is not conducive uh, to being able to maintain that that recovery. Uh, there are, you know, uh, places that are difficult that they're they're high in things, and so it's trying to align them. We have an employment readiness program that we we will run some of our individuals through because sometimes they haven't been employed for three, four, five, six years. Uh, so there's about a six month program. Then we try and help them find work that's more conducive uh, to what to what's going on. Uh, and of course, our stage four housing is affordable. So it's not market rent, so we're able to help them that way. Okay, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, now, your actual home base for Streets Alive is currently located right downtown across from the court building in Lethbridge. So maybe tell us about the new location and the building that, that you were blessed with. So 30 years ago, God called us to the downtown core. He provided facilities for us because uh, this is where the vulnerable needed the most help and where it seemed like the most hopelessness was. Uh, in January of 23, he released us from here. Uh, and quickly, um, through a series of events, the El Dorado property on the north side, 17,000 square foot building, uh, 2.59 acres came available, and we were able to pull the money together and have purchased it. We uh, are currently leasing it back to the owners because they need to rebuild, uh, but then we'll go in and renovate. The other thing that happened to us in the downtown is the needs has grown. Um, 30 years ago, we had 20 people on the street. Now our street population is in excess of 200. Uh, we were helping 10 or 12 people a day. Now we help 65 or 70. Uh, and so that we just needed more space. Uh, and so it's exciting. Um, the opportunity for us is, is there. God is this project and everything else is, is something he has called us to do. Uh, but the reality is this will only be done with his mar miraculous provision through his people. So those that feel called to help, to simply go to the website and tune in, click on the campaign. There's lots of information there and uh, you can choose to help however you want. Yeah, I, I mean, you, like you said, it's exciting, but at the same time, the fact that there's a need for it, it's kind of like, it's just so <laughs> sad as well. The, the difficulty is, is that 30 years ago, um, we were dealing largely with, with drugs that weren't going to kill you today. Today, we are dealing with, with drugs that will kill you instantly um and and depending on the batch that you get so that the, the need becomes more desperate to help these people get away from the drug life and to be able to move them into something that's a lot better uh, the stories you must hear on a daily basis ken uh we see them on a daily basis yeah yeah exactly. uh, yeah so uh, getting back to, to your your building plans, um, how are all these plans sitting with the, the city, like the municipality and, and the local community? Is there so, opposition uh, to your plan? Or are you generally getting support for this? Um, for the most part, we have support. There's okay. still always hurdles. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the the eight plaque project requires a rezoning and that that's in process, but we had a neighborhood meeting very favorable. The neighbors completely understand what we're trying to do because we've already been there three years. And so they're just looking forward because we're going to upgrade the building. It'll become a nice uh, feature within the community. It, it's 40 years old now, so it needs some some TLC, uh, but then it'll look like a new structure. No, oh, that's wonderful. It's that that is definitely certainly exciting. Absolutely. Um, you know, kind of going back to the basics here of, of what you guys do, um, is it completely voluntary for these people to come to you? Yes. Yeah. All of our services and our recovery programming and everything else is voluntary. Nobody is forced to do it and nobody is turned away. Um, uh, obviously, we're a faith based group, but that's not a criteria for them participating. Um, we're more than willing to help 
anyone who wants to receive our help. However, we, we make it clear we are biblical-based uh, programming, and uh, a lot of times most of the people that come in uh, uh, find they find their help in Christ because he is really the true healer that can help them out of the trauma and the things in their life. Mm -hmm. Do you find that sometimes people have to come back again and again and kind of redo the program with you? Uh, obviously, not everybody is successful off the hop. Mm -hmm. uh, we call ourselves the organization of a million second chances. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we'll we'll bring. There's a process, but we'll always bring people back and through. Uh, but we have a pretty high success rate of, of those that are committed to getting through it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, we love them and accept them where they are, and then we work yeah. with them, uh, challenge them, keep them accountable, and. Uh, and, and again, we have that success rate that we believe is, is, is really great. Right. We did talk a lot about men's help there, but you help women as well, of course, don't you? Yeah, we, we, have, uh, we, have up to, uh, we have up to, we have up to 14 women in the same kind of a program. Some of the programming that, they do, that we do is uh, joint and some is as, as a close, but yeah. Uh, and the, the women are at about the same rate of success as well. Um, our residences are our homes. That's what we try to create them to be, and and we create that home environment, and and uh, and we we give strength to it. And we're very excited about a lot of the successes. Um, we are seeing families reunited, uh, men getting uh, visitation and custody rates back to their children, uh, uh, those kinds of things. And it, this is just all God and His handiwork as people commit themselves to allowing him to heal them. Fabulous. And maybe really quickly remind us uh, how viewers can donate to the cause. Streetsalive.ca. Click on a donate button and uh, you, can, you can donate through Canada Helps. You can donate online. You can send us a check. Uh, the address is on the website. And if not, it is 323 4th Street, South Lethbridge, Alberta, T1K2G1. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Ken, for speaking with us today. So great to have you on again. Thank you very much for having me. It was great. Ken Kissick is the co-founder of Streets Alive Mission in Lethbridge. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks so much for watching.